All right. Hello, everybody. I'm Ted Waz, and I'm really happy to um, have you today uh, with our panel, Envisioning a Post-Pandemic Smart City in the U.S. and Globally. With me here today, we have some amazing experts who are going to share a little bit about themselves, about their focus, and um, we'll have some lively discussion around what to do next. So if I could first start, uh, Catherine, if you didn't introduce yourself. Sure, thank you. Uh, I've had a, an eclectic background. I spent most of my career running uh, tech companies, predominantly in Asia. Uh, then moved to Silicon Valley and became mayor of my city and was in local government for about 10 years. And now I'm running a, uh, an impact hub called Sapiens Impact, uh, where we're helping people uh, basically putting it all together in terms of governments and people and city and smart cities and how you can do amazing technical things that make people's lives better and do it uh, cheaper, greener more sustainably at the same time. Excellent. And uh, Ms. Carrie. Yeah, hi. I'm Carrie Cummings. I'm an American. I'm actually located in Germany. I'm the founder of MindBar, where we actually, I like the word impact. We work with um, individuals as well as teams and organizations to, um, be, to, to be, make more of an impact in their lives and in the world by... Um, we work with mainly um, high achievers, people who have really a lot of resources, internal and external, and when they realize they're not really in alignment, they're not acting in alignment with what they what their passions are. So we get them in alignment so that they can make more of an impact. And um, yeah, I. Yeah. Uh, we, and we'll we'll get back, Clyde. If you can give a little overview. Hi, greetings from Dublin. Uh, my name is Clyde Hutchison. I'm a general partner at Team ABC. We are an early stage venture capital fund focusing on making efficient and emission free travel and transportation. Uh, really focusing, our focus on cities is we want to make transportation better for everyone uh, from leaving their house to their destination. So I'm really excited to be talking about uh, especially in the context of U.S., where transportation is often difficult for the majority of the population. Excellent. Junaid. Great. Thanks for having me. My name is Junaid Islam. I'm a partner of UDA, which is a, a veteran-owned firm. Uh, UDA is primarily uh, former people who have served the U.S. intelligence community. At UDA, we do large-scale system design and risk management. Uh, so I spend every day working on smart cities, uh, really on how do... Uh, sensors connect to 5G networks, to machine learning systems. But a lot of the work I've been recently doing and why I look forward to this panel is making it not only sustainable, but open to all stakeholders. How do low income people live and interact in a smart city? How do you create incentives for people to take the bus <laughs> instead of the car? And, you know, how do we use things like tokenomics or Ethereum tokens to create, you know, uh, kind of uh, incentives? So, again, look forward to this panel. Excellent. And my name is Ted Waz, and I'm your panel host today. Uh, by training, I'm a clinical informaticist and a former acting CFO for Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, a CIO for a Fortune 42 healthcare insurance company a long time ago. And today I serve as the vice president of the board of directors for the G20 affiliate uh, WBAF World Economic Development Commission for Smart and Digital Cities. I'm also the vice chairman of a 2 billion euro asset management company focused on energy in West Africa. And I've been, I'm the chief executive development officer of a private equity company in Kuwait that manages 2 billion in assets for advanced technology integration around AI, IoT, and blockchain technology. And we have a focus on smart commercialization and smart city development. So it's an honor to be here with all of you. And um, so let's jump right in. So, um, Carrie, I'm going to start with you um, because you have a, a really unique aspect for uh, the post-pandemic smart city. The pandemic has created an unusual circumstance where 90 percent of the people who used to work in offices were suddenly um, either out of work or remote in their working environment. And that has created some challenging situations in terms of mental health. 
Can you talk to us a little bit about your perspective on mental health, the pandemic, and what smart and digital cities might be able to do to bridge the gap? Well, um, yeah, I obviously um, the home home office situation has, I think, hit people in different ways. So some have really embraced it and said, I want I always I, yeah, I want to stay at home. This is great. I don't want to ever go back to the office again. Um, others are suffering greatly, particularly um, to, to a couple who both are doing home office and, um, you know, there's jokes out there. I have, I hate my new uh, coworker, you know, uh, he's really annoying. Um, yeah, and that, you know, it's, we can make light of it and it's important to make, you know, light of it. But at the same time, it has really created um, a huge s- stress on even those who tend to enjoy being in home office. It's isolating us more um, and even when we're not in lockdown, when everything's closing, we're opening back up again, um, it still has created an isolation that has already been a trend in the last few decades of being farther away from family in big cities, um, you know, being isolated from each other. So I think it's extremely important um, to put this in the, for, the, the, the forefront of the discussion, to be honest with you. Um, mm-hmm. If, if I may, one of the things that um, I, my background in population health, I certainly look at a lot of these these things. And mm-hmm. um, what we've seen with the pandemic is, at least in the United States, a, a relaxation of those rules uh, around telehealth and uh, mm-hmm. telecommunication and telediagnostics. We've seen a rapid growth in advancement of uh, tools, for, especially around mental health that are mm-hmm. behavioral engines that help with diagnostics and facial expressions. Um, How do you see as, or what advice would you give to mayors of um, areas that may be struggling? Uh, What should they be thinking about in terms of addressing the population health needs of their their cities? Um, Struggling with the pandemic. With 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 just dealing, dealing with issues related to the pandemic and um, transitioning, um, either out of the pandemic and back to uh, a regular work environment or as they're continuing, because some areas are still very closed down. Well, you know, yes, that's true. And, and you know, even without the pandemic in rural areas, you have not very much access to um, mental health counseling. Right. Um, and sometimes people can't afford that. So, there's two aspects I see are, are big trends right now is one, obviously telehealth. It's, it's creating access to, I recently had a, someone from Pakistan uh, contact me with a mental health crisis. And um, I counseled him all the way from Germ- from Germany to Pakistan. And that, that's, that's possible through telehealth, right? Um, at the same time, Another thing that I found is a huge trend, at least over here in Germany, is group counseling mm-hmm. online. Um, that has become, you know, a, a huge opportunity to not only um, counsel a lot of people at the same time, but they learn from each other. And you tend to think um, a group situation might be less effective than a one-on-one. It actually can be even more effective because you learn from each other. So this, uh, the online um, group therapy, group coaching, doesn't matter, um, has really created a kind of like a catalyst for learn, learning from each other, but also um, compensating for that social isolation that we're experiencing. I appreciate creating that. Creating a community online. Thank you. And um, Catherine, as, as you're looking at the work you're doing, uh, with Sapiens and, and the impact for smart and digital cities, you, you have an interesting perspective because you're you're a former former mayor, um, you're a CEO that has recently taken over uh, during a global crisis, and the global crisis has impacted you locally. Um, so, can you give us a little bit of uh, flavor about the things that you're working on and the areas of focus um, with both the context? As, as a mayor and as a CEO and being impacted by a, a, a global supply chain. That's a lot in one. 
I was going to say, that's kind of a lot at once, you know, and, and taking a step back or like smart cities. What is that? What does that mean? What do I care about my city? You know, as long as they keep my roads clear, they pick up my trash, we're good. And what people don't realize is that I, I think it was the United Nations report came up and said that by 2050, there will be more people living in cities than in the entire population of Earth. Yeah. And while that's kind of like, wow, when you think about it, what does that mean? Well, that means really mundane things like like uh, traffic, like food, like infrastructure, energy, transportation, waste management. How are we how are we going to handle all these things? Uh, become critically important. And as we move into the fourth industrial revolution, and for people who aren't familiar with that, the fourth industrial revolution, industrial revolution is, is where we go from standalone systems and kind of the data revolution into where everything's connected. Mm -hmm. Everything is like clockwork. And it's, it's totally beyond the butterfly flapping its wings in Beijing. And it, and it really is, if this cog doesn't work, everything's going to fall apart. And so We've, we've entered an age where, from the city perspective, the IT department used to sit back here and take care of everybody's computers, and the IT department is now right in the center of everything. Everything hubs are around that, and we have to get it cr critically right. And things like autonomous vehicles. Um, it sounds really fun and cool to think about it, but there's a huge amount of planning and legal and infrastructure that needs to be uh, uh, pull, come together around that and, and, and drones when you talk about transportation as well. Uh, they're not just the cute little kid thing. We basically have drones nearly the size of helicopters that are being developed now for, for delivery. And uh, Wi-Fi, one of the great things we talk about uh, post-COVID is uh, it really, really was a slap in the face for uh, things like the disparity in, in Wi-Fi, the disparity in, and it's not just kids, we talk about equity in education, it's not just kids uh, can't, you know, zoom into a phone call, it gets down into kids, how are they doing their homework? Like this is, these are really, really critical issues. And I guess I'm biased. I, I also think that education is everything. That, that the greatest thing that any government can do is make sure that you have a solid, solid education for your children because they're the future. And yeah. if we have a chunk of the population that doesn't have access to, to Wi-Fi, doesn't have access to be able to do the homework and do these things, it is going to critically cripple that community. And one, and, one of the things that Chicago demonstrated was uh, early on in the pandemic, uh, as, as a city, they made available at, at the poorest neighborhoods in Chicago free Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. um, which was transformational from an educational perspective, from a mental health perspective, um, from a population health perspective, and from a community building perspective. It, it really made a dramatic difference because they simply made the decision that this was an important investment. So let me tell you really quickly a really interesting case study on how that can be done effectively and, and affordably. Uh, San Jose uh, was putting up new lights, new LED lights and all this stuff. And when they put up the lights, they said, oh, well, we can put repeaters on top. So they're basically rolling out 5G. And because of the, the savings, because it's LED, the lights basically pay for themselves in a period of time. But then they thought, well, hold on. Why are we spending taxpayer dollar to roll out you know, 5G for all these telcos? And so they basically made a deal with the telcos that the city would, would roll these out, but they would provide free... Uh, uh, 5G for uh, and and actually even bought laptops for the houses of the children that qualified for free and reduced price lunch. So we have the already qualified kids, and so it was a win-win-win. The kids got their laptops, they got the the Wi-Fi, uh, the city got better connectivity, LED lights. It was it was a really good negotiation. So I I really encourage more cities to work with the corporations when they're rolling these things out to find something that's equitable for everyone. That's a, a really great um, case study and an interesting segue for Janaid, um, who is doing some amazing work in Indiana around uh, 5G. Uh, Janaid, can you give us a, a little overview of some of the work you're doing and maybe sure. some of the challenges? Sure. So um, I think the, the most important thing I'd want to state as I talk about my work is what the panel is talking about, the human element. So in Indiana, uh, I uh, run something called the Indiana 5G Zone. We have a website, I encourage you to go to it. But uh, in, in the in what we do in the uh, Indiana 5G Zone, it actually functions as the state development lab. 
So we do things like smart manufacturing, smart transportation, where we're putting sensors on the highway to do dynamic lane assignment, supporting digital agriculture using hyperspectral imaging or over CBRS radios to Starlink to basically look at crop yields. Uh, also working on things to the panel's point, how do we connect rural schools uh, and give people opportunity? So the most important thing I learned about technology, uh, which the panel knows, the most important thing in technology is the human element. How is the community involved or are they not involved? How are non-technical people, we talked about mental health and the isolation, we can use smart cities to, uh, they can bring people in, but if you, if you don't do it properly, they'll push people out. So one of the, so there's two things that uh, I've learned. One, community development or community participation has to be involved in the design of smart cities. You cannot design this. Uh, you can't deploy the 5G, the millimeter wave radios, the machine learning, and then at the end of the process say, oh, you know, how, how do we include this? That, that does not work. As a technologist, uh, one of the things I've learned uh, is the importance of bringing in all stakeholders. And uh, that, that's very important. The other thing I've learned is providing some economic benefit for the stakeholders to participate. This is also something that's missing in many smart city projects, which is, you know, what's the economic upside, especially for low income people. So a couple of the concepts we're developing is, uh, you know, at the high end selling what I would call a premium reliable power to uh, factories who are automating as a way, you know, they pay more and they get their own lithium ion batteries. But at the, the lower income levels, we're developing this concept of creating a digital wallet on your phone where for energy, we will give you tokens and then you use that to pay for your power bill. But say there's a, 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 a draw on power because it's super hot and the airport and the hospital needs your power. The idea is those users or the state will actually put tokens in your wallet if you're willing to shut off your air conditioner for like two hours. But then the kind of tokens you get might be enough to pay for your energy for a whole week, right? So now there's an incentive for all people at whatever um, uh, position you have, but more importantly for the, our lower income people, giving them tokens, not just for energy, but for transportation, that, uh, giving them an incentive to say, you know, you can go downtown any way you want, but, you know, if you are willing to take the bus because there's a lot of congestion, we'll let you put a token in your wallet instead of taking the token out, right? So I think uh, everything we've discussed is important, but, you know, if there's one thing I'd want people to take away, the importance of involving people in the technology design phase. I, I appreciate that. And Clyde, um, you and I uh, both represent uh, an investment aspect of smart and digital cities. So, and, and it's an interesting segue um, that Janaid ended with transportation, because I, I know that's one of your key areas. Can you talk a little bit about uh, ABC Partners and uh, your goals and objectives and how you see the uh, post-pandemic world evolving? Well, I'm also a recovering epidemiologist and worked in digital health, so there's lots of weirdness. Excellent. You should, you should hug afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be good um, no, I think, I think one of the things where we're united within our firm is that transportation is frustrating. I think all of us have lost our temper at one point in any forms. Uh, usually for me, it's American airports, uh, but, um, but I think one of the challenges we have is that we're investing in technology, which is not going to be implemented for 10 years in the future. So we have really need to find the crystal ball. And I think one of the interesting parts to bring this back to a, what has COVID shown us is that there's been a real highlight on what happens with transportation goes wrong. So when supply chain breaks down, when <clears throat> airports can't function properly, and how we're reliant on all these things working together. And I think one of one of the things which we look at is why will someone fly in here? Why will you go through the torture of going to an airport? And airports are big, usually run by in the US, run by the municipalities. And can airports now suddenly become somewhere where people go for fun? And this is one of the areas we look at. Uh, a lot of people look at 
we're talking about flying taxis or EV tolls. That, that's not too long away. Most companies are saying that, that those are going to be flying in cities by 2024. Two years' time, we're going to have flying passenger taxis. What does that mean? What does that mean to people who have a very port on the top of their building or their condo and the noise around? So for us, we're seeing this almost, uh, I know Catherine talked about the fourth generation. We, we see the fourth re industrial revolution. We're seeing a complete change in transportation. Uh, and for us, cities need to be really involved in this because if you start to look at it, and we also we also have a base in Dubai, so we're looking at the Middle East where they're building new cities where new cities do not have cars. So they name them in Saudi Arabia, cars are not involved. Where in America, cars are the function of a city. The cities, all the roads go into the center of the city. So we have to look at the future where during your given day, living in a city, maybe going to work, maybe staying at home, you may be using five or six different forms of transportation. And what does that mean? And how can you do that? Do you use an app? Does the city own that app? How are you going to do interconnection? What are the digital support mechanisms for that? Um, how is it sustainable? Uh, and we're seeing a time of cities experimenting with transportation, which we have never seen before, where do you make, like in Detroit or in Luxembourg, make public transport completely free? Or do you look at, uh, such as Janae would say, do you tokenize it so that you reward people for good behavior? How do you encourage people to use a bus? Like we, I spend half my life in South America where buses are the most efficient way to get from A to B. Where in America, getting somebody on a Greyhound, I've turned up, I recently turned up in a meeting having to travel to the city on a Greyhound and the people were shocked <laughs> that I used a Greyhound. And I said, well, I invest in buses, so I should actually take a bus. So for, for us, it's looking at what, how do all these different forms of transport interlink? What are these digital supportive platforms? And also the people element, how do you encourage people to use transportation? Because in the next five years, we're going to see a change like we've never seen before in, in terms of transportation in cities. Yeah, and you know one of the one of the interesting things um, it, we're talking about people transportation, but um, cities also have to be thinking about transportation of material. Yeah. Um, I I don't know about about all you folks, but um, where I live, there are FedEx, DHL, and Amazon trucks. Um, in my neighborhood all of the time. Um, and I, I have several friends who live in the Northern part of the United States, that Northern highway structure where there are driverless trucks, um, which it's an experiment, but it's, it's an experiment that's happening now. Yeah. Um, so moving of, of large, large bundles of packages and mail and, and information happening along major highways. Well, if so you're as, the roads, they have these cute little like buggy things that will deliver yes. pizza to you. Oh, yeah. the, the, right. the, the yeah. noids. Yes, excellent. Well, uh, we have we have about um, 15 minutes left before we're going to start to wrap up. So what I'd like to um, ask you guys to think about is as we're looking at the next five years, we're, we're not quite out of the pandemic or the pandemic mentality yet. Um, what is what is something that if I'm a mayor of a city or I am a CEO of a company or I'm an investor, um, what should I be thinking about as I'm waking up in the morning and trying to think this year I need to accomplish something? What, what should that something be? And Carrie, I'm going to I'm going to start with you um, and and throw it out there. In terms of getting I. I I'm going to say what you've all said, the human factor. Um, you know, you were talking about um, how do we get new transportation concepts going and how can we get compliance, so to speak, um, participation. It's, you know, people want, as Catherine said, it to be easy and they want it to serve their purpose. Their purpose is not, not some, there are some people out there who are, have the goal of being environmentally um, friendly, 
Um, but most people just want to go visit their friend. They want to hop on an e-scooter. They want to. They don't want to stand in a traffic jam. They want to go do things that they want to do and live their life. And so I think we need to really go down to that stakeholder, the grassroots um, level, and say what do consumers, citizens, whatever, what how do what is motivating them and. Um, I think the the token system is, I think, uh, a really good aspect. I know um, uh, that's been done in the health healthcare aspect. Uh, Michael Dermer, I don't know if anybody knows him, but he, um, I know him, and it's a it's a great concept. So I think the the motive, what are the motivating factors? What are the basic needs of humans? What do we need? We want social connection, safety, um, and then you know at the top of the ladder. Um, higher goals, but I think those goals need to be kept in mind. So that's that's what I, my answer is. So one, one of our audience members would like to ask a question. And it's Sean, who is the chairman of the M- India Chamber of Commerce in the U.S. So Sean, go ahead. Sean, are you able to, to use the microphone now? Oh, looks like we lost Sean. Okay. Yep, oh, here. There he is. Thank you very much. Hi, Sean. I'm, I'm sorry to pitch in and uh, hello to everybody. I have a quick question because uh, the subject is very interesting and we're seeing post-pandemic cities in U.S. and globally. We're working on three different initiatives, one here in U.S., one in Egypt, and one in India. would like to hear from you on especially the, the university-based smart cities that we are building. Uh, we are in the contract phase right now. And so we'd like to know what is your thought process? Do you see any challenges? Uh, because we started this game about two years back and uh, we were not told that COVID would be coming and hitting us. Uh, you didn't so, get the memo? <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, there has been a significant delay. But nevertheless, I think now we are in a position to move forward. Um, so what's your reactions to this? And what, what is so, that you actually see and how do you uh, come yeah. out of it? So because I work for states, when they invest in smart infrastructure, energy, and transportation, workforce development is a big aspect. Uh, And one of the things we've done in Indiana is actually work with the Purdue University and uh, so that if you are um, an undergrad student, you can actually work in the lab. And this has been a win-win in the sense that the, the first batch of kids who started working in the lab as interns instantly got jobs because... They, we taught them 5G and sensors. It was a win for them. It was also a win for local manufacturers. And mm-hmm. if anything, what we learned is to increase that. So as we, as I start working in the state of Alabama, they actually want to do even more and expand out smart infrastructure and smart cities to high school kids. So that is that they know that this is a career option for them. You know, right. it's that they know this is a good reason to learn math and science because maybe you want to be a robotics engineer in a factory. Maybe you want to be a a machine learning expert to do autonomous uh, transportation. So I think uh, linking to the university community, including high schools, is very important as from a public policy perspective. Uh, And I'll just jump in to add onto that. I I think one of the most important bits for us as investors in startups is prototyping space Uh, and easy, an easy and valuable access for like one of the best incubator programs in the US is Greentown Labs. And they have a site in Houston where they are allowing sustainability companies to come in and prototypes, but also it's allowing bigger companies to come and see what they're prototyping and a space to do that. And also it's a way of attracting innovators to your area because one of the difficulties in that space is trying to get some, get your product to that point of being able to product market fit. So having the talent which the university will attract, but also a space where people can, almost like a maker space that people can prototype is really critically important. Awesome. And Catherine, as, as you're looking at your work, what, what do you think people should be focused on right now? Well, I mean, uh, I've mentioned education. Uh, I think Education's everything, but we also have to start looking at, at the infrastructure in terms of, of uh, energy, clean energy, and, and making sure that that's sustainable. That's critical. None of this works without that. Uh, but kind of answering uh, 
both Sean's question and, and the, the thing you said before, um, those things aside, a lot of a lot of split cities doing is moving things. It's moving people. It's moving delivery things. You know, it's and what what I read an interesting statistic the other day that almost half of the, the traffic in modern cities are people circling around looking for parking spaces or or taxis. Leave that. They're not people even getting somewhere. It's just the circling thing. So once we have autonomous cars that can actually find a place to, to rest and then come when they're called, you know, we, we're going to be able to, to not only manage a lot of the traffic issues. And, and traffic is not just, oh, well, it's bad for the environment. Traffic cuts out of your life. Those are hours every day cut out of your life trapped doing that. So when we make it more effective and more efficient for people, it's actually giving back a huge amount of, of quality time that they can spend with their family. And so we, we really need to start looking more at the autonomous, autonomous vehicles, not only within how we're going to, even things like we want uh, uh, autonomous vehicles, green trucks. Well, we can't have them all lined up like Tesla's on the side of the freeway. You know, I love that they're having these new freeways that have the ability to charge the trucks in that lane so they can charge as they're going. Now, these are critical, intelligent things that are, are really going to make things more effective and more efficient. And the same with, with drone delivery. Honestly, I'm, I'm a little freaked out by Amazon because I don't want drones flying around my neighborhood everywhere. That could actually become pretty problematic as well. Um, but we have to start thinking about how we do this in a way that it's not inconvenient for people, uh, that people enjoy doing it, and that they feel safe, uh, which is a little bit of the problem with greyhounds in the U.S. Um, and so, and, and as we're doing this, just really quickly, and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up, we have to make sure that, that we're supporting the communications. Uh, not only like, uh, I just heard Seoul is doing a metaverse for their city hall. You can actually walk in. It, that's cool. I mean, it's kind of a, look how cool we are, kind of a solution. I'm not really sure what problem it's solving. But then Simplicity, which is a really great app, is actually helping uh, cities communicate with people, push things out, and translate things into multiple languages for them. And I really want to encourage people, uh, cities as well as tech people, to talk more. That, you know, when you talk about uh, putting things in an incubator and putting them in a, in a sandbox and working them through, bring in the mayor. Educate the mayor on what you're doing. Get a better understanding of what the constraints are that the city's dealing with. We need to team up better and stop working in silos in terms of smart cities to be able to really understand the solution better and, and shorten the amount of time that we're tweaking back and forth and not really supporting the needs. I, I think that's probably one of the most critical aspects of um, working with innovation and with government. Um, the World Business Angel Fund and the G20 through the World Economic Development Commission uh, works with 127 countries and 500 cities around the world. And in the United States, Miami is an excellent example of a city that has started a grassroots movement for the expansion of its smart and digital um, utilization of assets. So it, it wasn't that they wanted to become a smart and digital city. It was that they wanted to better serve the population. They wanted to engage underserved individuals within their community and provide access in a way that made sense to them, how they could use the service, and in a way that both educated and informed. So um, there, there are some really exciting things going on there. As, as we're, we're coming down the, the home stretch, um, uh, Janae, as, as you're thinking about uh, the next five years and things that either, I mean, I know you're working with Indiana and you're going to work with Alabama. Um, what, what about some uh, rurally challenged areas that, you know, may not have dense populations? Um, what, what do you say to those those areas. So, so, so that's actually a great question. And both in my Indiana project and uh, Alabama project, making sure the rural citizens are not left out is a priority for the leadership at both states. Both governors uh, in our report will, uh, have expressed that that is something that can't be forgotten. So one experiment we just did in Indiana, this is all online. <laughs> this, is all, this is all taxpayer money. So you, you will own all of this. 
What we did is we used a, a, a Starlink node from SpaceX. We put it in a rural community, but that, that only has Wi-Fi, so it only goes a few hundred feet. Then we took unlicensed CBRS radios and went out about out a mile. So we basically lit up uh, 20 square miles by going out in different directions off of one satellite node. And part of the experiment was, you know, how low could we drop in pricing? And that's critical because the fundamental problem with 5G technologies is they're designed for urban environments, high density. So they assume you're going to have 5,000 users and their price point is a million dollars. Well, what if you only have three users, but they're kids and we can't forget the kids So I think one of the things as policymakers we have to do is not leave people behind. So the discussion today when we talked about mental health, low income, is critical. The the new smart economy cannot further disenfranchise our population, which includes rural. And this is where, if you are a mayor, you need to learn these technologies and proactively work with the vendors and policymakers at the state. I mean, so I would make that a high priority. Excellent. Clyde, uh, you know, I'm I'm sure you get asked this question all the time um, because whenever you manage funds or investment, people are always uh, asking, how do I get my project supported? What what would you say to to folks who have the next big idea and that fits your focus in in transportation and sustainability in a post-pandemic global city? Uh, well, first of all, I, I just want to make, add a little point, if I may, on to, um, for me, some of the most exciting places in the U.S. are not in, on the West Coast, sorry, California. For me, like the most exciting state is Ohio and Kentucky. Um, like Cincinnati, Cincinnati Airport is probably one of the most advanced thinking airports in the world now. They have SoftBank automation robots. They have Prime Air. You have Fly Ohio, which is working with NASA and FAA to say, how do we do this delivery drone thing? So I think often there is a misaligned belief that everything's happening in big cities where actually I'm a big fan of the Midwest. So from Chicago to St. Louis, we're down to into Savannah, uh, Charleston, Charlotte, those are the places which actually are things are happening and things are happening in a wrap up. Anyway, you're you're asking me the one the for me there is one major thing is are you solving a problem? Mm-hmm. And the challenge with a lot of of smart cities things is they're trying to force technology onto a city and also selling in cities is horrific because it just takes too long to scale and they're not really solving a problem. Um, and also, and that's, and, I, and the second part of you solving a problem is somebody going to buy it. So therefore, and that's the problem with smart city stuff is that I swear to God, if I see another beacon project, which is an IOT linked something sensor, which is picking up data, which nobody used because nobody actually uses data because everything's still paper based. Uh, it just drives us nuts. So you have to solve a problem. It has to be something which can be implemented and there has to be somebody who can buy it. Those are three really simple things. Uh, so you're talking uh, about e- EV tolls. I-, I think there's going to be a fundamental problem with not in my backyard. I think people in the cities will not put up with having passenger drones landing on a verdi port at the top of their building. I I can't see it happening. I can't see people going, yes, let my condo have the verdi port. So I think there's a lot of big challenges ahead. Uh, but I think for me is not a, until the thing about COVID, which has really made us happy, is suddenly people are looking at supply chain logistics and cargo and going, there's big problems and th- this area is no longer boring. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I would like them to work on that rather than getting people their goods for within 15 minutes of ordering. For me, last last mile delivery is not something which is important or a fundamental problem. I can cope with getting ice cream an hour later. And I think people should be looking at what are the big problems and how can I solve it? And is there somebody there to pay? Sorry, I went into a little bit of a rant there, but... No, <laughs> no you, it's, it's important, um, the information that you're sharing, because you're right. Um, as, as folks are looking at uh, presenting solutions, their, their objectives should be to solve a problem. 
They, it should be something that has a, a clear impact and is going to be acquired by the market um, and utilized. Um, what we don't need is a, a bunch of new pet rocks. Um, I, I may be the only one old enough to remember pet rocks, but I, I am fairly. Um, <laughs> but what you know is we're looking at smart and digital cities. Um, we, we hadn't even talked about smart smart water, uh, smart waste management, um, smart utilization for rubbish removal. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a, a project right now which cleans uh, uh, plastic out of the ocean. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, there, there are lots of really interesting things that can be done, but they have to be done in a way that makes sense, both financially, humanitarianly, uh, economically, and um, the to Carrie's point at the very beginning that contributes to the community in a way that builds on human behavior. Uh, Jeanette, every single one of us have talked about that. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're just got a little bit of time left. So I'm going to ask everybody to take uh, just 45 seconds and share a final thought. Uh, the one thing that people should walk away from this conversation uh, that is most important at, from your perspective as we face a brave new day tomorrow in this post-pandemic world. And Carrie, if we could start with you again. Yeah, um, you know, I'd, I'm going to repeat myself, but I, I think that it is the, the human need, basic important human need for connection, connecting with others. And I think this has been the challenge in the last couple of years, as we have been before that over-connected, too much, too much information, too much connection, always on. And then we went from that to nothing, basically, more or less. And um, where do we find the balance? And also, how can we um, integrate and u- use or utilize technology to um, b- have the balance, right? So just having a Zoom, everybody I know, um, and I've read about, <clears throat> excuse me, Zoom is having a zoom is not the same as being in the same room with someone. You just don't even, it's a different feeling. How can you, we use technology to still um, have that balance between social connection and being flexible and, and long distance. So I think that is really important for the next few years. Thank you, Carrie. Clyde. Um, for me, I think one of the biggest challenges is going to be, I hate to say it, electrification of transportation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I see, I really feel that this is going to be something which is going to be undemocratic and not, it's going to further divide populations. Uh, so I think it's something hopefully within the new administration's funding that where there are going to be electrification runs to the interstates, that it's something which cities will look at. And also there's a huge opportunity to collect data. <laughs> from electrification and make cities better from the information this provides. So I feel that this is going to be the number one challenge because I feel what we've noticed post pandemic is people are now are adding sustainability into their decision-making matrix where previously it wasn't necessarily part of it, but the majority of people we know as consumer, it may not be their, their sole decision but it is a part of the decision and as we and i think the tipping point to electrification of motors has happened in the u.s so the next biggest challenge is how do we do this democratically and enable that everybody is going to be able to be able to get access to electrification of their cars excellent Janae. Uh, we have a lot of exciting technologies 5g millimeter wave quantum computing machine learning. So it's really important as policymakers and advisors that we have on this panel that we become expert. So we know when, but also when not to use these technologies. Technology is not magic. It will not solve issues like mental health. It'll not solve issues like rural development unless we do it. So that uh, would be my closing thought to the uh, audience mm-hmm. watching this on YouTube. I appreciate it. And uh, Catherine, I, I opted to have have you comment last uh, because of your perspective, both as, as a CEO and as a mayor, if you could provide us guidance from both sides um, as we're facing that brave new tomorrow. 
I think what Janet said was was uh, critical uh, in the sense that we have to remember ch- people think, oh, technology, it's scary. AI is going to eat us. Technology is a tool. It's a hammer. I can beat you over the head. I can build you a house. And, and therein lies the problem with policy. We have to be very thoughtful. We have to make sure that we're not doing something just because it's shiny and cool. We have to make sure that there's a problem we're solving. And we have to communicate that out to the people, and not only the people that are going to be using it, but the people that are developing it. These are the problems that we have. Because let's face it, change stinks. This is why change management people make the big bucks. Nobody likes change, or very rarely do we like change. So we have to work on targeting the problem. We have to work on, when we do it, making as much as possible, making that solution seamless and easy and that people feel included and heard and validated as we're moving forward. And don't assume that your mayor knows this stuff. Most mayors are lawyers or you know, they come from, from all these different areas. And I started having events in the middle of Silicon Valley for the local elected officials where we brought in tech people to talk about what is 5G? What's happening with these cars we keep hearing about? And they love that. They're so appreciative. So that I think if you come you know, respectfully to your uh, city people and work with them and help educate them, quite often they're so grateful and so thankful to be able to have the information necessary to make policy that's going to, to help everyone involved. So I just hope that everybody can, can work and communicate better as a team in creating not only the technology, but the policy for how we use these. I want to thank each and every one of you. Um, you have brought an awful lot to the conversation. That was the fastest 45 minutes I've ever uh, facilitated a panel. And um, Catherine, Carrie, Clyde, and Janaid, um, I hope that we'll be able to stay in touch after this discussion uh, because I just selfishly want to pick your brains as we move forward. Um, thanks very much, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you very much.